Next on Unsolved Mysteries. A convicted murderer escapes from prison with the deputy warden's wife. Is she a hostage or an accomplice? A respected police officer has a UFO encounter that has even the skeptics convinced. The assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. Did James Earl Ray act alone or was he part of a conspiracy? And an update about a man sentenced to life in prison for a murder he says he didn't commit. I'm Dennis Farina, and this is Unsolved Mysteries. Granite, Oklahoma. Home of the Oklahoma State Reformatory, a medium security prison. It was a normal work day for Deputy Warden Randy Parker until he received a strange call from his daughter. Deputy Warden's office. Hi, Dad, it's me. Um, Mom's not here right now. She's not. And I just came in and Brandy was sitting all alone on the floor. A half hour later, Parker's wife, Bobby, was still not at home. She's not home yet? Listen, uh, He asked guards to check on a prison trustee who worked with his wife at their home. The inmate, Randolph Franklin Dial, was also missing. Be advised, inmate Dial is not in his cell. I knew at that point that Dial had escaped in the fear that he had taken Bobby, but yet I hadn't. I hadn't admitted that to myself yet. It was Randy Parker's worst nightmare. His wife, the mother of his two girls, kidnapped by a killer. But was Bobby Parker really abducted, or did she run off with a convicted criminal? Randolph Franklin Dial was a confessed contract killer. I told me to get off of his property, and I pulled the piece out and fired once hitting him approximately right here. Dial served eight years of hard time. Then he was transferred to a minimum security unit for good behavior. Prison officials consider Dial a model prisoner. Randolph Dial was given trustee status. He was given full run of the prison. In fact, as a trustee, even though he was under a murder conviction, he was given access to property outside the prison. There was really no supervision over Randolph Dial. Dial's regular work assignment was caretaker at the home of Deputy Warden Randy Parker. Randy, his wife Bobby, and their two daughters lived right next door to the prison. Over the years, Bobby Parker had worked with inmates as a volunteer for some rehabilitation programs. She and Randolph Dial began working together when money was donated to start a prison arts project. On it anyway. Dial often spent time alone with Bobby in her garage, which had been converted into a ceramics studio. You know what? We can make a fortune. Go into business together. We are. We're making good money. Think of the money the prison's making. I think that he probably read more into the working relationship than, than what was actually there. You know, a man's locked up for over eight years, going on nine years. He has a woman who is very attractive, very cordial, very compassionate, caring. So, honey, are you going to have another late night? The day Dial and Bobby disappeared began like any other. I love you. Love you. Have a good day. Oh. Dial was working in the yard when Randy left his house. Take it easy on him over there, sir. When Randy came home for lunch, he found a note from Bobby saying that she had gone shopping and that his sandwich was in the refrigerator. It was not anything out of the ordinary at all to see a note there, let me know where she was, um, being concerned that I would be worried or uh, having my lunch there for me. Randy went back to work. 
Later, he received the call from his daughter saying Bobby was missing. Mommy's gone shopping. She'll be home real soon. Daddy'll be home in a little bit. OK, thanks, Dad. Hi, sweetie. Hi, Daddy. Mom still isn't home yet. Randy arrived home a half hour later. Bobby was still not there. He began to fear the worst. Then I began to think back. You know, I hadn't seen Dial since this morning. Morning, Miss Parker. And usually when I come home for lunch, he's usually there hanging out. Trade jobs with you. Take it easy on him over there, sir. When Randy found out that Dial was missing, he was afraid that the inmate had abducted Bobby in the family van. Hello. Mom, it's me. Hi, Bobby. Later that day, Bobby called her mother, crying and upset. I need you to call up Randy. All right. Bobby told her that everything would soon be OK and asked her to tell her daughters that she loved them. Oh, I got to go. And she hung up. And I knew immediately that she had been abducted because my daughter wouldn't talk like that. Bobby. She would have called her own girls and uh, everything. She was not a crying person. I didn't know what Dow was going to do, if he, how he was going to harm her, hurt her, threaten her. And, and of course, I was worried sick about her, but then I was also worried, you know, how am I going to tell the girls? The next day, Bobby called her best friend with the same message. The friend also felt that Bobby was being held against her will. 24 hours later, the Parker's van was found abandoned just across the Texas border. The vehicle was basically clean. We found uh, no indications that a, a violent struggle had taken place in the vehicle. There were no blood splatterings at all. We did find uh, cigarettes there, basic cigarettes, which was the brand that Randolph Dial smoked. Randy Parker then found out that Dial had been trying to get Valium from other inmates. If he could have got some Valium to her in a glass of tea or something. Then he picked her up and he walked her out to the van. And he laid her down in there and he took off. I believe that's what happened. That's a girl. That's it. But authorities had to consider another possibility. That Bobby Parker had willingly run off with Dial. It does appear that there was a certain fascination that Randolph Dahl had for, for Bobby Parker. From interviews with other inmates at the institution, he made comments indicating that, that he was uh, romantically attracted to Bobby. We don't know if that was uh, reciprocated in any fashion. My wife did not leave voluntarily with Dahl. She did not fall in love with him. I believe that to the very depths of my soul that that is, that is not even within the realm of possibilities that she would abandon two children, run off with an inmate who's, who's, who's convicted for murder, throw away everything that she's ever had. That's just not even possible. That is absurd and ridiculous. They'll make this quick. 10 days after Bobby disappeared, she called her brother's wife. Once again, Bobby sounded upset she asked her sister-in-law to tell the girls that she loved them it's and that everything would be all right. Listen, I need you to do me and that was the last contact that anybody's had that I know of. That's been a long time, and I just keep waiting for another phone call, keep waiting for something. Over the next four weeks, there were some sightings of Randolph Dial and a woman who might have been Bobby Parker. One of the most credible was at an art sale. If the woman with Dial was Bobby, she had either dyed her hair blonde or was wearing a wig. I want my wife back. I want her back today, this minute. You know, those kids have got to have their mother. Nothing, nothing, not my career, not anything matters but her getting returned back. I just want her back. Update. After being on the run for 10 years, Randolph Dial and Bobby Parker had been found living together in a small town in Texas. A tip led law enforcement agents to a mobile home where Dial was arrested. Bobby Parker was found working on a nearby ranch. According to news reports, Dial said that his relationship with Bobby was never romantic. 
He said that she lived in fear that he would harm her or her family if she tried to leave. Randolph Dial was returned to prison with seven years added to his sentence for the escape. He died in 2007 while still behind bars. Bobby Parker has been reunited with her family. Coming up, was James Earl Ray the real assassin of Martin Luther King? And next, a veteran police officer has an otherworldly encounter in the New Mexico desert. The small town of Socorro, New Mexico. On April 24, 1964, police officer Lonnie Zamora spotted a local teenager speeding through town. Officer Zamora followed the teenager to the edge of Socorro and out into the desert. Zamora had no idea of the strange twist his life was about to take. Lonnie Zamora would soon find himself at the center of the best documented UFO sighting on record, one that the U.S. Air Force has labeled unexplained. Socorro, to Socorro. Socorro, go ahead. Well, going up to halfway, so I could see a white object to my left. I thought it was a turnover car. When I got up on top of the mesa there, I looked down, and I seen this uh, big white object uh, on the ground. I thought I could see something around the craft there. I could see some figures. It looked like they were walking around the craft. According to Lonnie, there were red markings on the hull, a vertical arrow with a horizontal line beneath it and a crescent-shaped line above it. Socorro 2, Socorro. Lonnie tried to radio police headquarters, but was not able to break through the heavy static. After hearing two metallic sounds, like doors clanging shut, Lonnie noticed that the small figures were gone. I saw this flame come on from underneath it, and I ran back behind my car, and it went up to 20, 30 feet up in the air. So it just stayed there for a while, and then finally just took off slowly to the west. At first, you know, after I got to my senses, I said, did I see it or didn't I, you know? Or what happened, you know? With his radio now static-free, Lonnie called an old friend, Sergeant Sam Chavez of the New Mexico State Police. Lonnie told him to hurry to the site. Okay. What happened out here? I could tell that Lonnie I saw, was I saw, excited yeah, I saw, I saw and probably it. scared. Lonnie Samora, he's a very dependable, honest type of person. He's not one to create or make stories or, or, or build things up to, to make it exciting or anything like that. What the hell is this? We found some indentation on the ground where this thing had landed, and the, the marks into the ground were nine inches deep, eight inches long, and nine inches wide. I started looking for tracks, human tracks. But the only thing I found was uh, impressions on the ground. They were made by a perfect circle. But I found no human tracks, no shoe prints. U.S. Army officials at the nearby White Sands Missile Range sent Captain Richard T. Holder to investigate. Well, my first impression was that it was something from the range that needed possible help, you know, first aid, attention, or at best, security. 
The more I got into it, the less convinced I was that that was the case. Holder noticed the unusual marks left in the sand and a bush burned to a crisp only on one side. Gentlemen, this area is now officially designated sensitive. Everything we saw seemed to support the story that Officer Zamora recounted. Nothing gave me the slightest hint that he did this as a hoax or cooked it up for fame or fortune. After their investigation, the Air Force agreed that Lonnie saw something, but they insisted that it must have been a secret military aircraft. What we're looking for they never were talent, able to find talent, any such evidence that any such thing was being tested at the time. And in fact, even today, not an iota of evidence has emerged to support that claim. Nonetheless, the Air Force line on the case is that this is a credible witness. He clearly saw some kind of flying vehicle and that it must have been something that we built even if we can't find it anywhere. Air Force officials brought in Dr. J. Allen Hynek he was a respected astronomer and consultant on Project Blue Book, the Air Force's official study of the UFO phenomenon. Dr. Hynek found that the physical evidence was convincing, but the most persuasive argument for a genuine UFO sighting was Lonnie Zamora himself. OK, Lonnie, now these depressions, you said, were actually from the outriggers. They of... held up the craft. All Dr. Hynek was enormously impressed by Lonnie Zamora. He thought there was virtually no possibility of a hoax. He expressed huge disdain for the Blue Book handling of the report. And he said that it was clear that the story that Blue Book had cooked up about this possibly being some kind of experimental aircraft was a story that even Blue Book knew to be untrue, but which was invented to keep Congress from harassing the Air Force. How do we explain what Lonnie Zamora saw? No matter what others believe, Lonnie has no doubt that what he witnessed was not of this Earth. If they want to believe me, good. If they don't want to believe me, it's all right, too. Next, the government says that James Earl Ray was the lone assassin of Martin Luther King Jr. But new evidence suggests a different story. A long life, longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. Civil rights leader Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. delivered one of his most stirring and prophetic speeches. And I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. Less than 24 hours later, Dr. King would be dead. He was shot by an assassin's bullet as he left his motel for dinner. His accused killer, James Earl Ray, pled guilty to the murder and the case was officially closed. But just three days after his conviction, Ray recanted his guilty plea. He now claimed that he was just a pawn in a conspiracy to kill Dr. King. Ray's claims of innocence were dismissed and the case remained closed. Years later, a congressional committee of the U.S. House of Representatives determined that James Earl Ray was the lone assassin of Dr. King. But Walter Fontroy, the chairman of the King subcommittee, now believed that conclusion was wrong. When you look at a murder, you look at three things. Uh, who had the motive, the means, and the opportunity. I'm not now satisfied that James Earl Ray had a sufficient motive, that he had the means and certainly the opportunity to pull it off as it was done. Right up until his death in 1998, James Earl Ray maintained that he did not shoot Martin Luther King. The FBI says that he acted alone. But now some researchers have new evidence that backs up Ray's allegations of a conspiracy. 
organizations, grassroots organizations. Uh, Martin Luther King arrived in Memphis the day before he was assassinated. King checked into the Lorraine Motel and began planning a march in support of striking city sanitation workers. King's presence at the motel had been well publicized by the press. Across the street from the motel was a rooming house. On April 4th, just before 6 p.m., Williams Anschutz, a tenant of the rooming house, found the building's communal bathroom locked. Come on, man, I gotta take a leak. What follows is the official government account of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. Inside the bathroom, James Earl Ray, a career petty criminal, loaded a high-powered rifle and took aim at the Lorraine Motel. According to the government, James Earl Ray then raced into the room he had rented earlier that day. He wrapped the rifle, along with an overnight bag containing personal items, into a bedspread. In the hallway, Ray was seen by Charles Stevens, who lived in the room next to the bathroom. As he was making his getaway, the government believes that Ray was panicked by a police car and dropped his bundle in the doorway of the Knipe Amusement Company. A moment later, three witnesses inside the building saw a white car, possibly a Mustang, speed away. Police recovered the rifle, along with Ray's personal items. But by the time they identified Ray, he had left the country. Two months later, Ray was arrested in London as he tried to board a flight to Brussels. James Earl Ray eventually pled guilty to the murder of Martin Luther King and was sentenced to 99 years in prison. Just three days after his conviction, Ray announced that he had been pressured into pleading guilty. He said he did not shoot King and was the victim of a conspiracy. He claimed that he was a scapegoat and he was set up by a mysterious figure named Raoul. On the surface, James Earl Ray did not seem like the kind of criminal who would commit murder. His crimes were small-time holdups and robberies. I find it more difficult today to believe that James Earl Ray, acting alone, pulled off the crime of the century, was able to get out of Memphis, out of the country into Canada, to get three passports, and to go all the way to Europe without help. Almost a year before King was assassinated, Ray escaped from a state prison where he was serving a 20-year sentence for robbing a grocery store. Ray made his way to Montreal and using the name Eric Starvel Galt, tried to get a phony ID. Ray said that it was here that he was approached by a shadowy character who called himself Raoul. I hear you're looking for something. Yeah, you heard right. According to Ray, when they first met, Raoul was only looking for an accomplice in a smuggling scheme. What else do you need? In exchange for Ray's agreeing to perform certain uh, tasks, evidently of a criminal nature, one, he was provided with money, and two, he was promised that at some point he would be given identification, a passport, something he needed to get out of the country. Where will these deliveries be? Ray said that he was instructed to smuggle contraband into Detroit from Canada. Ray claimed that he was then directed by Raoul to go to Birmingham, Alabama. What Raoul did from that point on was to uh, keep James on a string, have him in various points and places, pay him bits of money, have him do various things, and really pretty much keep him on a string so that he was available, as it turns out, for use any time that they wanted to use him, always with the promise of these travel documents. Ray said that in Birmingham, Raul gave him $2,000 and told him to buy a car. Seven months before the assassination, Ray did buy a white 1966 Mustang. You got yourself one hell of a car. Over the next several months, Ray said his smuggling jobs with Raul took him to Mexico, 
Los Angeles, and then Atlanta. In Atlanta, just five days before the assassination, Raul gave him his next job. What for? The next bit of activity they were going to be involved in had to do with selling guns. The scenario that he developed was one which involved the purchase of sort of sample weapons that he, Raul, would show to these gun runners. Following Raul's instructions, Ray drove to a gun shop in Birmingham where he purchased a .243 caliber rifle with a telescopic sight. Can I help? Yeah, I'm looking for a rifle. The evidence is, is that uh, from the people who witnessed his purchase of the rifle in, the, uh, in Birmingham is that he didn't know the first thing about rifles. So he didn't have the kind of familiarity with firearms that you would expect of somebody who was going to murder someone. This isn't going to work. Why? The caliber's too small. I was wondering if I could exchange it. Why is that? Is there something wrong with this one? Ray said Raul told him to exchange the weapon the next day, giving him specific instructions on what to buy. Uh, Remington model, 760 Game Master, pump action. Ray claimed he gave the Remington rifle to Raul at a motel in Memphis on April 3rd, the day before the assassination. This will do fine. Ray said so that was the last time he saw the rifle. The same one the government concluded was used to kill Martin Luther King. Next, we'll examine evidence which may corroborate Ray's story of a conspiracy. Memphis, Tennessee, the day of Martin Luther King's assassination. According to James Earl Ray, he met his contact, Raul, at a local coffee shop. Sorry, I'm late. I'm going to need a room to meet Ray me. said Raul told him to go to the rooming house upstairs, rent a room, and then await instructions. OK. The boarding house was on Main Street next to the Knipe Amusement Company, where the rifle would later be found. The back windows of the boarding house faced Mulberry Street and the Lorraine Motel, where Dr. King was staying. Couple of nights, maybe. At 4 p.m., Ray rented a room using an alias, John Willard. Raul had instructed Ray to bring along an overnight bag so he wouldn't look suspicious. And he told him to leave the Mustang parked nearby. Yeah, I'll take it. Pay in advance. What happened over the next hour, no one knows for sure. Ray himself has changed his story several times but he was always clear that he left the boarding house at around 5 p.m. and never returned. I was at a service station during the time that uh, Martin Luther King was shot. Ray said that just before 6 p.m., he drove the Mustang to a local service station. I got a leak on the back tires. Got a minute to take a look at it? Not right now. We're awful busy. Could you come back in a couple of hours? All right. Ray claimed that at 6.01, the very moment King was shot, he was driving from the gas station back to the rooming house, unaware of what happened. And as he got to the corner of Calhoun in South Main, uh, he saw already that there were police barricades and policemen everywhere. The state makes a great deal of the fact that James fled the scene, you know. And they, uh, but James was, one must remember, a fugitive. He was on the run, and he was certainly not going to hang around wherever he saw police. Did James Earl Ray target Dr. King from the window of the rooming house? Some say it's unlikely because of Ray's apparent lack of skill with firearms. In the Army, he was trained with an M1, and he was at the lowest level of ability. The idea of loading by hand a single shot into uh, that 30 6 and uh, gambling everything on that one shot makes no sense whatsoever. You have to bear in mind that from the window of the rooming house to the balcony where Dr. King was killed was less than 100 yards. With a telescopic sight at such a short distance, almost anyone in the world could have killed Dr. King. It, it really required no great marksmanship whatsoever. The official version says that when Ray ran from his room in the boarding house, he was seen by another tenant. 
Charles Stevens. From all accounts, Stevens was so dead drunk that there's no way of relying upon uh, his testimony about the uh, shot. In fact, we did not rely on him for an eyewitness identification. What we did rely on him for was uh, having sufficient senses to be aware of a loud noise uh, down the hall and in the bathroom and to open the door and see somebody run by. What you have to realize about uh, Charlie Stevens is that he was looking for a reward. He was trying to get the $100,000 reward that had been put up for uh, anyone who could identify uh, the slayer of Dr. King. The government report said that Ray ran by the Knipe Amusement Company and dropped his weapon in a panic. But is it believable that any killer, no matter how panicked, would drop a bundle of personal items that could so easily identify him? It strikes many people myself included, that that looks like a setup, that somebody else gathered that evidence up and planted it there. A dusting of the rooming house turned up a number of fingerprints which were never identified. That's not really strange. I've worked any number of cases where you don't find fingerprints when you think you should. You may find a lot of smudges and smears, but you won't find a fingerprint that in itself is, is complete enough to make a positive identification. The abandoned rifle had two fingerprints on it belonging to James Earl Ray. But for some reason, the FBI never conducted a swab test to determine if the rifle had ever been fired. My recollection is that it had a spent shell that was in the chamber. So common sense would tell you that someone had fired that rifle. The FBI also could not match the bullet which killed King with the rifle. All they could say was that the bullet was consistent with that type of rifle. The fact that the bullet markings are consistent with having been from the rifle means absolutely nothing. It was also consistent with several million other rifles of the same kind. Ray bought the rifle. The rifle was used to shoot King. Uh, he fled the scene. His fingerprints are on it. His explanations for an alibi, his flight, uh, all don't hold water. Even for those who believe Ray's story, there's still one nagging question. If James Earl Ray is innocent, why would he plead guilty? I just am not going to discuss it. It's a Ray claimed that he was coerced by his attorney, who wanted exclusive publishing rights to his story. If Ray had testified in court, his allegations of conspiracy would have become public domain. This will do fine. The most important element of Ray's conspiracy story was the man who called himself Raul. In our investigation to identify Ray and to find out what he did and where and when, we turned up nothing to indicate that there was either a Raul or any other conspirator involved in this crime. Former defense investigator Harold Weisberg has reviewed 60,000 pages of FBI documents on the King assassination. He says he found references to a mysterious individual named J.C. Harton. When I was going through the files of the Los Angeles FBI office, I found where a man who used the name of J.C. Harden had called Jimmy from Atlanta. Yeah, he's here around 3.13, but he's out. I saw him go out about an hour ago. Ask him to call James C. Harden. H-A-R-D-I-N. When Jimmy didn't return the call, so far as we know, Harden then went out to California, and he met with Jimmy. This is, con this is a confirmed story in the FBI's records. Is it possible that J.C. Harden, who visited Ray three weeks before the assassination, was the mysterious Raul? In 1968, the FBI pursued the lead long enough to create this sketch of J.C. Harden. It was based on a description given by the manager of the St. Francis Hotel. But after James Earl Ray was arrested, the FBI dropped their investigation of Harden. We knew nothing about Harden. I'd like to find Mr. Harden. That may lead us to a different conclusion. Do you think you've got
James Earl Ray refused to say whether J.C. Harden and Raoul were the same person. In 1998, James Earl Ray died of liver failure, taking the true story of his involvement in the King assassination to his grave. There is no way that James Earl Ray is a lone assassin. James Earl Ray is the classic patsy. Will we ever know? The answer is no. We won't know because the FBI didn't conduct an adequate conspiracy investigation. I've seen the promised land. And that's one of the tragedies in Dr. King's death. He did not get in his death an uh, investigation commensurate with the dignity of his life. Had he gotten it, uh, many of the unanswered questions about his death uh, would have answers today. Next, a man wrongfully accused of murder is set free, thanks in part to Unsolved Mysteries. Fort Lauderdale, Florida. We previously brought you the story of John Purvis, a diagnosed schizophrenic who many believed was convicted of a murder that he did not commit. In early November, police in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, arrived at the home of Susan Hamwe. They were responding to a call from one of Susan's friends who said that Susan had not answered her phone for days. Susan was 38 years old, divorced, and the mother of an 18-month-old daughter. She was found dead on her kitchen floor, sexually molested, strangled with a telephone cord, and stabbed through the heart with a carving knife. Because Susan's body was not discovered for several days, her daughter died in her crib from dehydration. At the scene, Police found a bloody carving knife with no fingerprints and some strands of red hair. Statement? What kind of statement? The next day, detectives questioned Susan's neighbors. Two doors away, they talked to 66-year-old Emma Jo Bartlett and her 40-year-old red-haired son, John Purvis. Oh, good. Would you like to come down to the station and give a statement? Well, if my mama can come with me. Chad. John's mother went with him to the station, but was not allowed in the interrogation room. The detectives who questioned John were unaware that he suffered from schizophrenia. Schizophrenics often cannot tell the difference between the real world and their own delusions. Well, they asked me if I knew Susan, and I said I just barely knew the girl at all. Then my mother came up, and, and she busted in the door, and she said, you have no right to interrogate my son like this. She said, my son did not kill the girl. We don't know who killed the girl. Why aren't you out looking for the real victim, real killer and everything? That's what she told him when she busted in everything. Well, we don't have anything else. Well, then let him go. Come on, get out. Let him go. John's mother took her son and stormed out. But the police still wanted to question John Purvis alone. Four weeks later, they got their chance. Psychiatrist Dr. Joe Klass was brought in to administer a personality test using what are called TAT cards. TAT cards feature ambiguous drawings which the test subject must interpret. John had an unusual reaction to one of the cards. Keep in mind, John is schizophrenic. Will I have to go to jail or can I, can I, can I go to hospital? Hospital. I remember even feeling intimidated because he showed such a strong reaction. Do you, do you think I did it? After saying several times, uh, do you think I did it? Do you think I did it? And I said, I don't know, because uh, I didn't want to use any leading comments. And he said, I killed her, I liked her, and then implied that she did not respond to him in a favorable way. John later confessed to the police. Those detectives down there at the police department told me that. They said, if you'll confess that you killed Susan, we'll let you go home. So I had to say something in order to get out of there. So I just said something. I just said I killed her. That was all. I had to make something up, though. At the trial, only the confession John made to Dr. Class was allowed into evidence. 
Even though that confession did not match the details of the crime, and even though John Purvis's hair did not match the hair found at the scene, he was still convicted of murdering Susan Hamwee and her daughter, Shane. Update. John Purvis had been in prison for eight and a half years when we aired his story. The broadcast brought new interest to the case, and the Fort Lauderdale police decided that it might be time to reopen their investigation. The new investigation focused on Susan Hamwee's ex-husband, Paul, a wealthy real estate developer in Aspen, Colorado. At the time of the murder, Paul Hamwee was in Aspen, recovering from a broken leg. Following up on a tip, Fort Lauderdale police questioned a man named Robert Beckett. In return for immunity, Beckett confessed that he and an accomplice, Paul Serio, had been paid $14,000 to murder Susan. Beckett said that he was hired by Paul Hamwee and that his motive was to avoid paying $180,000 in alimony. Paul Hamwee was arrested for the murder of his wife. That same week, after nine years spent in prison for a crime that he did not commit, John Purvis was finally released. I just feel good about everything. I just feel good. He said, Mom, you're not going to ever go home again. I said, sure, you're going to go home, John, and I know you are. The excitement of this whole case was John Purvis being let out. I can't sit here and think of any other crime that a man was convicted on such circumstantial evidence. John Purvis moved back in with his mother. He was later paid $1 million by the city of Fort Lauderdale to drop any further claims against the police department. Paul Hamwee and Paul Serio were both convicted in the murder of Hamwee's wife and were sentenced to life in prison. 